JJ asks about the Bitcoin Cash hard fork that took place on November 15th. That was the day before yesterday, so we're just two days from the moment of the hard fork. And lots of you had a variety of questions about what this hard fork was, how it happened, um, what happened exactly. So, what happened in this particular um, situation? Bitcoin Cash is a chain that was created on August 1st, uh, 2017. And, uh, that chain um, was split off of uh, Bitcoin. So that was a fork that happened on August 1st, 2017. And November 15th, 2018, there was a second hard fork. So I can give you some of the information of what I think happened from reading about this. Um, and I hope this information is as accurate as I can uh, explain it. Uh, plans were made by the uh, developers who were um, developing the most common uh, Bitcoin Cash node software, which was called Bitcoin ABC. And this is the software that most of the Bitcoin Cash network was running. And Bitcoin ABC developers decided to add um, two or three uh, basic features to the Bitcoin Cash chain in a non-backwards compatible hard fork upgrade. And what happens when you do a hard fork update is that the rules of consensus change, so that any clients that do not upgrade to the new rules are unable to follow the chain. And as a result, um, either all clients have to upgrade or whichever clients do not upgrade, um, essentially create a separate fork. Now, in this particular case, um, two major changes were made. One of them is called Op Data Sig Verify. Um, An Op Data Sig Verify is um, a script language opcode that operates inside the Bitcoin script that allows a transaction to validate a signature on an external message. So typically, when you check a signature in Bitcoin script, you can check a signature that is signing the transaction itself, either all of the inputs and outputs, that's called a sig hash all, or some of the inputs, some of the outputs, or just the inputs, or just the outputs. There are a couple of different varieties. But data sig verify actually signs a separate message, and what that allows you to do is have, as part of a transaction, a message that comes from an external source, perhaps uh, an oracle. That's one of the use cases. An oracle is a service that provides signed data um, about external events. So um, you could use that for a variety of purposes, including to do various um, sidechain type operations. Um, where you have uh, a proof that comes from outside the network. So, um, data sig verify was one of the upgrades, and the other one was a change called CTOR, canonical transaction ordering (CTOR). And what canonical transaction ordering does is it changes the way blocks are built and the consensus rules around blocks, so that the transactions within a block have to have a specific ordering. Now, in um, in classic Bitcoin, if you want, and the the way uh, Bitcoin Cash works before this change, transactions are ordered um, effectively at a random order with just a few constraints. You can put transactions in a block in any order you want, or the miners can put transactions in a block in any order they want. There's one one important uh, constraint, and that is if uh, two transactions depend on each other, uh, meaning they are a chain, whereby uh, the second transaction spends an output created by the first transaction, you can put them in the same block, but they have to be in order, meaning that if you process the transactions one by one, you have to process the parent and then the child, and so they have to be in that order in the block. And that's so you can validate double spends. Now, CTOR, canonical transaction ordering, is a consensus rule change that requires the transactions within a Bitcoin Cash block um, to be ordered lexicographically, meaning 
alpha, the alphabetic or alphanumeric order of the transaction ID. So they're sorted. And what that allows you to do is a certain type of optimization, which is called outputs then inputs, whereby you can um, go quickly through the all of the outputs created in order. Um, by all of the transactions, validate those, and then validate all the inputs. And by doing that, you can do validation of transactions in the future, potentially in parallel, where you can effectively have um, separate threads uh, or even perhaps separate processes validating transactions in parallel. Now, this becomes an important optimization when you have large blocks, because the ability to validate transactions. Uh, fast is critical to being able to validate the block. And the bigger the block, the more of a burden that is on validation. So, CTOR, canonical transaction ordering, was the second change made by Bitcoin ABC. Um, and both of these were not backwards compatible. However, not everyone um, in the Bitcoin Cash environment agreed with these two changes. And um, Another group of developers decided that this was not a good direction to take the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. And they proposed uh, another set of changes called Bitcoin SV, or Bitcoin Satoshi's Vision. And the idea with Bitcoin SV is to introduce uh, a block size increase to 128 megabytes per block. Um, a, an increase in the limit of uh, script operations that can be included in a transaction to enable more complex uh, contracts or scripts within a transaction, as well as the introduction of about five different um, new script operands, which were ones that had been previously disabled, um, that allow some very interesting complex scripts to be run. Um, these include op mul, which is for multiplication, as well as op l shift and r shift, which is for uh, left bitwise shift and right bitwise shift. Um, these types of operations can be used to manipulate um, numbers in interesting ways uh, and um, enable more complex smart contracts. So, um, two different groups within the Bitcoin Cash community um, proposing two different sets of changes, both of which are not backwards compatible, both of which require changes to the consensus rules, and both of which create um, uh, new chains. And as soon as the uh, fork happened for Bitcoin ABC um, and Bitcoin SV, essentially the old original Bitcoin Cash chain. Um, no longer continues. Nobody's mining the original rules. Now, from that moment on, um, two groups are mining two different rule sets, creating two competing forks, and those are now effectively called Bitcoin Cash ABC and Bitcoin Cash SV or Bitcoin SV Satoshi's Vision. And um, there was a bit of a um, hash war, as some commentators noted, where uh, different parts of the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem um, were trying to dominate um, the uh, to dominate the hashing power within the chain, so that um, the two chains could really proceed in a way that they uh, competed against each other, and so it was a bit of a competition about who had the most hash power. And there was some discussion about um, potentially some attacks against one or the other chain, meaning that um, groups within the Bitcoin Cash environment could potentially mine um, competitively to cause a reorganization of the other chain um, in um, in a competition, essentially. So that's what happened. Um, this is the technical explanation of what happened. Uh, of course, as in everything Bitcoin, um, it, aside from the technical explanation, there was a boatload of drama and various characters making various threats, um, leaked emails, forged emails, um, public accusations, lots of live streams, videos, and podcasts made about all of the personalities and um, who would dominate over this fight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, mostly worth ignoring. Um, the end result is that if you had coins, 
on uh, the Bitcoin Cash chain, if you own Bitcoin Cash in any addresses, then um, as of the moment after the fork, you effectively now own an equal amount of the Bitcoin Cash ABC and Bitcoin SV um, coins on the two competing chains. So it effectively works like a airdrop or fork, uh, and you can theoretically now um, split those coins and um, keep them, sell them, do whatever you want, and you have a bit of on each chain. Uh, there was some drama spillover into the Bitcoin blockchain as well, with some price movement as well as a hash rate decline. As different groups that needed all of the hashing power to engage in this competition in Bitcoin Cash withdrew some of their mining from Bitcoin temporarily. Not really a big deal. Um, the mempool is a bit full right now, and the price went down um, by 10, 15 percent or so, which you know. In Bitcoin terms, is what we call a Wednesday, um, so not that exciting. Jun asks, "What is replay protection?" I have no idea what replay protection means. I've heard of this terminology being thrown around during debates about Bitcoin forks. Could you please help me understand why replay protection is important and relate it to an example? Thank you. So. Replay protection is um, a, a technique, perhaps I should call it, um, or a solution to a specific type of problem, which is if you have a fork and you have two independent chains that arise from a fork, and you have a certain value that you had on the parent uh, fork that is now has two child's forks, and you want to move the money, but you want to move the money only on one chain. So, for example, in the recent form, you had some Bitcoin Cash, and now you have Bitcoin Cash ABC and Bitcoin Cash SV or Bitcoin SV. And now that you have both of these, you essentially have both of these coins controlled by the same keys under the same address, but um, there are two different chains that track two different ledgers with a common history. So if you want to move, um, let's say you wanted to move your Bitcoin ABC to an exchange in order to sell it, um, and you get a, a, an address from the exchange, and you uh, create a transaction, and that transaction um, you transmit on the Bitcoin ABC blockchain. Great. So the Bitcoin ABC has now moved. Now, if there's no equivalent transaction on Bitcoin SV, then on Bitcoin SV, the money will still be under the old keys, the original address. Whereas on Bitcoin ABC, the money will now have moved to a new address, and effectively you've achieved a split. You've managed to split your coins or separate the two um, histories. But if the transaction that you transmitted on Bitcoin ABC is technically equivalent and, and has no replay protection, um, then anyone can take that transaction, um, receive it on the Bitcoin ABC chain, and then retransmit it on the Bitcoin SV chain, and have a miner included there. So now, effectively, your coins moved on both chains. And you wanted to just move one set of coins, but you've now moved on both chains because the transaction was valid under both rule sets, and anyone can retransmit it to the other blockchain. So how do you stop? Um, how do you stop the transaction from replay? How do you ensure that uh, something you do only happens on one of the two chains, so you can effectively split control of these coins? And once you've done this once, once you've achieved one transaction that is not replayed, then at that point the coins will be under different addresses, and from that point on, on one chain they'll already be spent from that address. On the other one they won't, so that you can use different keys to control them on different chains, and you've solved the problem. They now have completely different histories. Effectively, your coins have forked. But um, and until you do that first replay protected transaction, you have a problem. So replay protection can be achieved in a number of different ways. One of the things you can do, <coughs> for example, is you can have uh, you can use within your transaction um, some kind of script 
uh, component that is not compatible on both chains. Let's say, for example, the in the current Bitcoin Cash fork, um, you could have as part of your transaction uh, some inputs and outputs that move your coins, and another output or um, input calculation that used um, op uh, data sig verify. Now, op data sig verify only exists on the Bitcoin ABC fork, and as a result. If you replay that transaction on Bitcoin SV, it would be invalid because it contains an operand that Bitcoin uh, SV doesn't have. So you would effectively achieve replay protection by introducing uh, some uh, script operand that only exists on one chain. You could do it the other way, of course. You could include an op mal or op l shift in the script. Um, in one of the insignificant tiny outputs, you could put a tiny amount against it. And as a result, that would ensure that that transaction was only valid on Bitcoin SV and would be considered invalid on Bitcoin ABC. And once you've done that one transaction that can only be played on one chain, from that point on, your your two sets of uh, coins essentially have divergent history. You can now manipulate them separately with different keys and not worry about things happening inadvertently. Um, and that. Uh, that is what replay protection means. If it is not implemented explicitly by the developers in their forking mechanism, then you have to find a way to do it, so that um, you can do a transaction without that transaction being replayed. Uh, by the way, replay protection is not something that only matters in Bitcoin. Um, replay protection was also needed in uh, the Ethereum Ethereum Classic uh, fork. So in Ethereum Ethereum Classic fork, the way uh, you do replay protection is actually through a smart contract um, that has different behavior on one fork than on the other fork. And so you send your money to that smart contract, and it behaves differently depending on which fork you're on. Both forks execute the transaction. But they have a different outcome. So effectively, you've uh, split your coins and uh, achieved replay protection. So the same thing that we talked about before, where you have a script that only works on one chain and doesn't work on the other, you can do with a smart contract that only works on one chain, not the other, or that works differently on one chain and the other, and again get replay protection. This is a consideration for any blockchain that has these forking characteristics. Um, where you can have a hard fork and produce two incompatible chains.